Father, your word is our plumb line, our guideline. We now ask you to spiritually take what we just confessed and make it real to us. That the things that we think, they would be changed. And the things that we do, they would follow what you've done in our heart. Use your word now to mold us and shape us. Use the lips of this foolish, foolish man to speak a word that would change the lives of some, even if one person here, God, that's enough. Thank you for being the God that leaves the 99 to get the one. We ask you to do these things for the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to read to you the beginning and the end of what we're um, going to study today, and then we're going to read the body, because I have to set this up. It's very important that I set this up. Because all month long, as we've looked at 2 Corinthians, I've been saying the Word of God is for me the foundation. It's the capstone. It's the cornerstone. I believe wholeheartedly that this book has everything that I need. I believe it. I have to, because everything else that I believed in has failed. When I was younger, I believed in strength until there was somebody stronger than me. When I was younger, I believed in relationships and still they started to fall apart. I believed that my father, I remember believing that my father was the strongest man in the world. I remember telling myself, my father is the strongest man in the world. First, it's God, then it's my father. I'm telling you, no question about it. And then as I, I watched the frailty of my father, it, it cracked something in my, I just, I remember everything that I put my trust in starting to fade and starting to break and starting to wane. And what is it? Where do you come to the place where what you, you know how the Bible talks about building that foundation on a rock? I built my foundation on so much sand. Even after getting married, you know, I, I got saved and I got married and me and my wife had kids. I, I put so much stock in my wife. She was everything to me. She had just done so much for me. Sticking around when I was terrible and then staying with me, I just... She's human. She's a woman. She, and she, she let me down. My father let me down. My relationships let me down. Where do you go from here? What's left? As you watch, as you watch all the people on TV whom you respect and trust, the American idols, they all fall apart and their kids are a mess. So I had to, at some point in time, there I was, a crying mess. And I said, I painted my life into the proverbial corner. Prison, financial ruin, family mess, nothing left. And there I was in the corner. There I was, no square left to stand on. And I looked up and I said, um, <laughs> would you take me now? And so faithful and so good and so merciful. God said, are you kidding me? This is what I've been waiting for. Now, me, it's like, oh, now you want me? Now when you got nothing left? God isn't me. And you're not God. I, I love that saying. It says, the best of men are at best men. Here, Paul making an impassioned cry to these people trying to explain to them the exact same thing I'm trying to explain to you. Listen to what he says. O ye Corinthians, verse 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, our mouth is open to you. Our heart is enlarged. He says, I'm speaking to you because I love you. Why do you think I'm here? Corinthian church. Christian. Why do you think I'm speaking? Do you think I've got nothing better to do than to tell you what's wrong with your life, your match? Yes, let me tell you something. Become a minister. It's wonderful. You paint a big red mark on your chest, 
a big red mark on your wife, a big red mark on your children, and the enemy goes, wait, I can't see them. Oh, there they are, the ones with the red. Boom, boom, boom. And you go, oh, th thanks, God. Thanks. This is what I get for being in ministry? You go after my children? It's hard. You wake up and feel sorry for yourself. I got better things to do than sit here. I, I can be snake hunting right now, man. It's, the sun's just coming. It was just rained. Sun's come back. Man, I can go back. You know what? Ju -ju the mats are open. I'm out of here. No. Man, I love this life. My heart is wide open. I carry you around. I pray for you when I wake up in the middle of the night. I see your faces and your names. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is opened unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Let me read that to you. He says, you are not straightened. You can circle that word for straightened and write twisted up, torqued, or bound. You're not jacked up. You're not tweaked because of what I said. You know how many people have left the church? They come here and their kids are 10, 11 years old. And I go, dude, you're heading for huge problems with your kid. How dare you say that to me? Bro, I got better things to do. My mouth is open. My heart is open. I'm telling you that because we can see it. And the kid turns 13, starts doing drugs, starts sleeping around, starts doing the internet chunk. You cursed him. I cursed him. We laugh. Let me tell you something. It happens almost every month at this church. You're not straightened, Paul said to the church in Corinth, because of me. I didn't do this. You're straightened in your own bowels. You could circle that word for bowels and right next to it, inward affections, desires. Inward affections, desires. You're straightened, you're twisted, you're torqued because you have no self-control over the things that are bad for you. Well, how am I supposed to know what's bad? How am I supposed to know what's good? Ta-da! The book that's in your hand tells you what's good and what's bad. And you don't walk by feelings. You walk by faith that what this book says is going to do you well. Let's see. Married. Toughest thing I've ever done by far. Really prefer not to be married most of the time. Can I just sleep when I want, get up when I want, let my wife take care of the kids, make me my favorite meal? Can it just be like that? Oh, the Bible says to pray with your wife. The Bible says to read your wife the word. The Bible says to have your house filled with worship music. The Bible says to not forsake the gathering of the brethren as a manner of some. And you come to me, or they came to Paul, not to please, I'm not putting myself on his level by any means. I just have experience, that's it. And he says, life's messed up. He says, are you doing what the Bible says? No. I can't help you then. What do you mean? This is your fault. Why is it my fault? You're the one that told me. No, I just told you what the Word of God said. Word of God changed. The Bible says that the, 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 the sun can fall out of the sky. The trees can die. One thing stands forever. The Word of God. So, after a couple of years of walking with the Lord and beating my head against the walls of the church and my house and everything else, I finally said, you know what? I'm convinced. If it says it, I need to do it. And I'm going to do my darndest to make sure that I'm not doing what this Bible says not to do and I am doing what this thing says to do. Why? Because God's plan for you is good. My son really hates schoolwork. So as a good father, I told him, you never need to do school again. Don't worry about it. I threw his books in the garbage and I broke all his pencils. What are you thinking about me right now? You thinking I'm a bad dad? Well, you have a heavenly father, a whole lot smarter than me, who loves you a whole lot more than I love my son, believe it or not, if you can imagine that, who goes, I know what's best for you. Would you trust me? 
No, but I really want that relationship. It's bad for you. But I really want it. I want to be it. No, it's bad for you. I'm mad at God. Why? Because he took something from me I wanted. Well, you can live your life mad at God, or you can say, why am I mad at the one who loves me more than I even love myself? Verse 13. Now for recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. And here's what he says in, in American English. Again, because Paul, he's way too smart for me. He said, can you do me a favor and open your heart to me as I've opened my heart to you? Let me tell you one of the weirdest things about being a pastor. And you all know, I've been walking with the Lord almost 20 years. I've been a pastor for about the last, a senior pastor for about the last six and a half years. The weirdest thing that I've ever seen happen. People will come here. I will get involved in their life. Me and my wife and my kids, we dig into their dirt, their garbage. We, we, we help them. We, we teach them. We show them. We fight with them. We cry with them. We, and then two years, three years down the road, they're an important part of church. And I say something like a word from the pulpit. Or I do something and they go, oh, we're out of here. And we go, huh? Where are you going? Uh, well, um, we have a difference of opinion. About what? Now, if it sounds like I'm boohoo and I'm making make you feel sorry, I'm not. I'm just telling you what Paul said. Paul's like, look, I've opened my heart to you. I put my life, Paul, so much more than me. Listen, nobody's in here trying to kill me for doing this. Paul went from town to town to town, sharing the love of Christ with people, with people who wanted to kill him. Everywhere he went, people wanted to kill him. And you know why he did it? For the people that would come and want to hear God's word. And what did they repay him with? By going, oh, we don't believe you. Then why are you here? We don't like you. Why are you here? I don't get it. You come here, but you don't like me. Well, I'm a, kind of a part of the church here. Well, I like the people of the church. I see. Let me put it to you this way. My brothers and sisters, it's what I tell my son. Me and my son, we have a secret handshake. I can't show you, but it's secret, but I can't show you. And we look at each other and we say, your enemies are my enemies. My friends are your friends. Whom you love, I love. Whom you hate, I hate. It's the way it is. That's the way it is. Your enemies, they're my enemies. Your friends are my friends. Whom you love, I love. Whom you hate, I will hate with a perfect hatred. People don't like to hear that. They want happy. Let's have, why don't we have more roses in the church? I want more roses, more pink colors. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Verse, um, skip verse 14, 15, 16, and 17, and look at 18. This is all still the introduction, guys. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God says, I love you. I want to be your father. I want you to be my sons and daughters. What I'm about to teach you, what I'm about to tell you, what God's Word says here will help you tremendously. Let me tell you a story about my life briefly. I got saved, and about two years after I got saved, from some things that I did before I got saved, I had to go to prison. When I, got in, when I went to prison, I was gone for about a year in a federal prison in Miami. It was a non-drug, non-violent offense. It was pretty light time, except being away from my family was terrible. Other than that, when I got out, a guy comes to me and he says, Ryan, I know you just got out, bro, and I just, I love you. Let's open up a pet store on Miami Beach. Pet store, Miami Beach. Man, look, I got money. Father gave me a bunch of money to open up a business. He moved from upstate New York, came down here. It's like, all right, yes. So I start planning, and I come up with ideas. You know, you get a lot of time to think in prison. <laughs> I came out with some great ideas. 
Let's do it. Yes. He puts the money in account. I go to church literally two weeks later and Pastor Bob, my pastor, is teaching this exact section of scripture. Please. Verse 14 says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Why such a big introduction? Because what I'm about to say to you today will not sit well with you. Some of you will, like me, swallow a jagged pill. No milk, not even water. Just a dry, nasty pill on an August hot day where you And every time you go, you're going to see the pill at the back of your throat starting to dissolve. I had to illustrate it like that. Because Paul begged them. And do you know why Paul begged them to listen to this message? Because the end of my story after two years in business with a non-believer, it was a sheer misery. Time and money and what it cost me in my relationship with the Lord. Listen to what Paul writes to the church in Corinth. Do not be unequally yoked with a non-believer. Do not be in business with them. Do not marry them. Now, he does not say do not hang out with them. He does not say do not hire them. He does not say don't be around them. He didn't want you to put your kids in a Christian church. You go to work at a church. He didn't want you to sequester yourself so far away from the world that you cannot be an effective witness. What he said was don't be unequally yoked. That word for yoke, let me explain what that is. In olden times, when we lived in an agricultural society, people had yoke of oxen. Our Lord Jesus said to his apostles, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And it is written about him that he was a carpenter. He would take a big piece of wood, and he would go over the, your house, and he'd, he'd feel the necks of your oxen, feel the shape of it, and he'd carve out the wood. And you'd have, like, imagine a big piece of plywood with holes in it. And he'd sit it right over the yoke. One here. And there'd be sometimes two and three pieces. And he'd put it over their necks, and they'd drive. And that's how they drive the field, and they'd plow the field. Everybody not know what I'm talking about? Here's what he says. How in the world can you plow a field when you're yoked with somebody going in the wrong direction? Imagine that. Can you imagine? Just consider my folly for a second. You're a farmer. And you get this yoke, and on one side it goes head in this way, and on the other side it goes head in this way. And you have one ox going this way, and the other ox going that way, and you get, this don't work. You're like, no, it's got to work. No, it don't work. No, there's got to be something wrong with this thing. No, no, it works fine. And you come over, and they see, and your field looks like this. And I go, dude, what happened to your field? Nothing. There's nothing wrong with my field. Bro, you got, your, you got the ox in the wrong side of the yoke. No, I don't. This is your fault. Why is it my fault? Because you told me my ox is going the wrong way. I didn't put the ox in the wrong way. <laughs> I was uh, 21 years old or 22 when I moved down to Florida. It was 1988. I'm 46 now. Let that be. You don't have to do the math. <laughs> I lived in Miami Beach and I met this girl. Uh, first girl I met while I was down here, and uh, she spoke not a word of English. My Spanish consisted of hola, como esta? <laughs> but she was beautiful. And I was just madly crazy for her. 
I learned to speak Spanish, she learned to speak English. Over the course of six months, you know what I found out? I really didn't like what she had to say. <laughs> and I didn't like her near as much as I thought I did when I couldn't understand the things that she was saying. That word for unequally yoked, one of the meanings is different language. If you are about to go in business with somebody, if you're about to sign a contract, if you are about to sign a marriage contract and that person does not know the Lord as their savior, you are making a mistake that will cost you more than you want to pay. I don't know who is here. I don't know what it is that you're facing. But when my pastor taught this, I said to myself, as soon as he said that, he ain't talking to me. No, I'm not going into business. It's, it's, you are. He's going to be your partner. He'll own half the suit. No. I said, no. I was about three and a half, four years old in the Lord. I was young in the Lord, zealous for God. I was going to put it. Well, no, see, I'm going to put a Bible out in my store. I'm going to have a Bible verse on my door. When you come to my store in Miami, I had a store called World Wild, it was called. It was in Miami Beach, right on Washington, 28th and Washington. For two years it was there. Beautiful store. We spent lots of money. Lots of time driving back and forth to Miami every day. It was gorgeous. Didn't make any money. Made a landlord rich. Oh, my goodness. Listen to me. Let me describe it to you the way my pastor described it that very day, which I ignored him. Anybody here go fishing? Anybody like fishing? Anybody know what a, a barb is? A barb. See, you got a hook, and on the back you have a barb. Well, forget about that. Anybody know what a treble hook is? <laughs> Much more than a barb, a treble hook. I think they're illegal now. Can't you, you're not allowed to fish with them some places, right? A treble hook is a hook that has four hooks on it. It's like this. Anybody not know what a treble hook is? Okay. Take one hook and then put all four of them back to back so that the whole thing is like just... A, a, a thing, and you, you put your bait on there and you throw it out and fish bites it. And you stick them in all different ways. And you reel it up and there it goes. He ain't getting off because he bit the thing. You got it off. Now the hard part is trying to get that hook out of its mouth without shredding its mouth. If you're going to eat the fish, what's the difference? You just cut his lips off and you, 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 you know, you... Yeah, I know, nobody's ever done that, right? <laughs> I love that about America. T completely different subject. I love that about America. We love meat and hate killing cows. We love chicken but don't like pulling out feathers. It's like, you think just because somebody else does it, it doesn't mean you're responsible? Cut it out. <laughs> anyway, you, pull, you, you, you got that treble hook, right? Now picture the sin that you're about to enter is that treble hook. That contract, that, that vow, that, that thing that you're about to do now that I'm preaching to you. I listened to my pastor talk about the barb and you will not get out of it without scars. You will not get out of it without pain. It takes a long time and the journey, some don't survive. Some don't survive. And I'm not talking about death, I'm talking about spiritual death. Because at a point in time, you've got to look at yourself and go, listen, I could either let my wife and kids be broke with me or I can do something that I shouldn't do that will keep us in food. Let me tell you, not a place you want to be. That is a battle. Whew, that's a battle. Um, let me read that to you again and go through these real quick. Be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? You ever go into the bathroom and light a match? In your old pothead days, maybe, when you're hiding it from your father or something like that? I don't know why you would do that. I just, it's really bad. I, I don't know why I just thought of that. I never did smoke that stuff, but my brother did a lot. You go into any place that it's dark and you shine a light, causes darkness to flee. Do you notice that light and darkness cannot exist together? It just can't happen. I mean, you could have red on a paper, and you can have blue on a paper, you can have gray on a paper, you can have all the colors, but there is no such thing as light and darkness in one place. Light cancels out darkness. No matter how much darkness you throw on light, it's still light. He says it's, it's like that. 
He's trying to illustrate why you don't do this. Continuing, verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? You could circle that word for Belial. It's just another word for the devil. It's just another word. Belial is the devil. There's no concord. There's no, there is no unity. Any unity that you get will be deception that will cause you pain and death. The devil came to kill, to steal, and destroy. The devil is a liar and the father of lies. Do not be unequally yoked. Do not put your head, your heart, your mind, your body, your life contractually with an unbeliever. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? If you are married to somebody who is a non-believer, do you understand that you're moving in two separate directions? One is destined for heaven. One is destined for hell. And more than the destiny of your soul, the destiny of everything you do. Well, I can't cheat on my taxes. How come? Because I'm a Christian. Well, I can't do that. Why not? Because I'm a Christian. I'm not talking about people who just have a decent moral set of values. There is something that as a Christian, you must draw the line. And let me give it to you even further. If you are a single person here and you say to me, but I just met them and they're Catholic, or I just met them and they're this, or I just met them and they're that, and I say, listen, sister, unless they love the Lord Jesus more than they love you, that's not the one for you. Let me tell you something. The day I realized I was married to the right woman was the day my wife said, I will do anything for you and I will do anything with you, but I will not sin for you. And I said, no, no, no. You worship me. You'll do what I say. And she said, that's the line I won't cross. You can pack up your crap and get out because I ain't doing it. Mm. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It was the worst day and the best day of my life. I realized I was safe with this woman. I was safe. I can trust this woman. Because she loves the Lord more than she loved me, her faithfulness to me didn't depend upon me. And that's how I also fell in love with the Lord so that I love the Lord more than I love my wife. My wife took the kids and she went up to Georgia. You know what she's not doing? She's not calling me every 15 Who are you with? What are you doing? I'm with Austin and we're staring at the TV eating potato chips. <laughs> Did you eat? And I get a call from his wife. Did you feed my husband? What am I going to feed your husband for? Because he won't eat when I'm not there. He's just like you. <laughs> We're eating hard pretzels and drinking ginger ale. Don't worry about it. She didn't worry that I went to the bar. She didn't worry that my old buddy called me up. She didn't worry that I was on Facebook and some, some girlfriend from my past. Didn't happen. You know why? Don't have a Facebook. Don't believe in it. Think it's disgusting. Not, not if you have a Facebook. God bless you. If, it keeps, if you can do it without sinning, you're stronger than me. I don't, I can't, I'm, not, I'm a sinner, so I don't do it. However, because I love the Lord. So again, if you are here about to enter into a communion with somebody and you say, what's my standard? What's my guideline? What's my rule? They have to love the Lord more than they love you. They have to be, at, well, they're Catholic. Well, hey, listen, half my family's Catholic. I don't have a problem with Catholics. But you got to be born again. you got to be on fire for the Lord. There's a Bible verse I always stand on. When anybody's going into a business, I say, listen, there's a Bible verse that says, he who partners with a thief hates his own life, for he swears to tell the truth, but tells him nothing. He who partners with, if you partner with a thief, you must hate yourself, because you're going to ask him for the truth, but he won't reveal a darn thing to you. You understand that? Continuing on. What agreement hath the temple of God, verse 16, with idols? You didn't come in here and you didn't see statues, did you? No temple Diana, no Ashtaroth pole. You didn't come and see a statue of, of Mary or Peter or anything else. You know why? We're a Christian church. We're a Christian church. We're a Bible-believing Christian church. We don't have idols for you to worship. You worship one thing in here. Christ Jesus. That's it. We're not a cult of personality, in case you haven't figured out. I learned something. I'm not very good looking. 
and I don't talk well. And that don't matter because you didn't come here for me, does it? Anybody ever see that? Oh, there's an old uh, Saturday Night Live routine with, with Farley. What was his name? Chris Farley. Chris Farley when he, he, he plays like this, uh, this, he plays this, uh, this uh, what was that? This dancer, this guy dancer. And he has on the suit and the ties and all that stuff. Patrick Swayze. Remember when he does that thing with Patrick Swayze? And he goes, well, what happened? Well, I didn't get the job. And he goes, well, it turns out I'm not very good looking. <laughs> and I can't dance. This is not the cult of personality. Turns out you're here for Christ, I hope. Turns out that way. You turn the mares down? It's a little hot in here? Yes. I don't know where the temperature keeps going up now. Thank you, Austin. Verse um, 17, actually the last part of 16, I like that even better. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And now what he's doing, he's quoting Old Testament scripture because he wants you to know not only is this now, this is back then. He says this is from the book of Ezekiel and the book of Isaiah. I want you, I love you, I want to be a part of your life. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Here's what he says here. Come out from among them. He switches gears here and here's where I'm going to get a little bit personal. Well, what if my husband already is a non-believer and I'm already married? What if I'm already in business? Isn't that a bad witness if I just kind of dump my partner? Listen, I would never break up a marriage, but in, in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 7, do you know it says if you're married to an unbeliever and they want to go, you let them go. You don't beg them to stay. You, if you're married to an unbeliever and they want to leave, you got to let them go. Do you know what kind of crazy phenomenon I've seen of men and women who will follow these people who have abused them, misused them, and they want to go, no, please stay, I'll change. What are you going to do? Let me tell you how the Lord Jesus put it. And here's where we're going to finish. I want you to turn, please, a few pages to the left to the book of Mark in the ninth chapter. Mark chapter 9. Listen. I'm giving you an impassioned plea. You will hear some things today that might really touch your heart because I'm going to tell you about my life. But I want you to know something. I'm doing this because of the treachery that exists. And there is somebody here, maybe more than one, whom the enemy is whispering. And it's a calm and cool voice. It's a loving, gentle, wooing voice. It is not for you. It's a lie. It's a barbed hook. It's a treble hook. You with me? Verse 17 of Mark chapter 9 says, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him. And he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples, and they that they would cast it out, and they could not. Please give me your attention. This guy from the multitude walks up to the Lord and says, Listen, my son can't speak. He foams at the mouth. He cusses. He fusses. He, he gets twisted up, straightened. I brought him to your disciples. I brought him to the church. I brought him to the elders. I brought him to the pastors. And I asked him, Please, can you please help my son? Can you please help my son? and they couldn't do a darn thing. Let me give you the scene, okay? I'm 11 or 12 years old. My brother is 14 or 15. And I hear my father screaming from the other room. I'll kill you! I will kill you! I will not let this happen to you! I will kill you! I was like, what the heck is going on? So I went in the other room to watch, and there my brother was on the floor, in the living room floor. <laughs> Can't talk. He's so stoned out of his head, some kind of trip or PCP or something, and my father's got him by the arm, and he's lifting. He can't even stand up. He's lifting him off the ground, yelling, I will kill you before I let this happen to you. I will kill you. I was freaked. I was like,
my father's son. In my family, there was four brothers. My oldest brother, he died very young. Then my brother, whom I'm speaking about now, when he got on drugs, when he was about 12 or 13, he started smoking herb. My father freaked, he couldn't handle it, because my father raised him to be a baseball player. My, my brother was an incredible athlete. Stack of scholarship offers churches, every, at churches, uh, schools everywhere. And he started smoking that junk, and then he, from, the, from the pot, he got into the PCP. And my father would rather him dead than see him like this. Imagine. Does anybody not? I will kill you before. Now, I have a son. And now I'm remembering these things, and I am so afraid because I know the weakness that runs in my blood. I know it. So what will I do to prevent this from happening to my son, to my daughters? Anything. Anything. Do you understand me? You know what my father did? He yelled and he screamed. But did he stop smoking herb? Did he stop doing drugs? Did he cleanse his house? Did he bring us to God? No. We went to this drug program. We went to that drug program. He went to this psychiatrist, psychologist, psychotherapist. And in case you are new to our church, it was exactly one year ago this month at 47 years old that I buried my brother. And we sat right here and I did his funeral. I did my brother's funeral for all my family and his friends. And the anger and the frustration and the pain, rage. And I got a call from one of his friends telling me, oh, the Grateful Dead, they, they mentioned his name. You were having a memorial, you should come up. I said, if I have, you have a memorial and I come up, it won't be happy for anybody. I'm not even gonna tell you some of the things that I said to him because you'd think even less of me than you do. Guys, look, look what happened here again. Let me read this to you again. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto you my son. He's twisted with a dumb spirit. And wherever I go, it tears at him. Wherever my parents took me and my brother, we caused problems. Every family gathering, every family meeting, either I was sneaking drinks or my brother got their stoned. You could be sure wherever me and my brother were, we caused problems. You can guarantee it. Wherever he taketh him, he teareth him, and foameth, and gnashes with his teeth, and pineth him away. And I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out. Fix him for me. Fix him. Because I'd rather him dead than watch my son die at 47 of drug abuse. Young brothers and sisters, listen to what I'm telling you here. Y'all listen to me. Because when they come to you with that junk that they want you to do, know you've taken the first step to death and it will kill you. He answered him and said, here's what the Lord said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Me! He said to them, psychiatrists in our modern day that don't know what demon possession is, they laugh, they make fun of it. It's a joke. Oh, there's no such thing as a devil. And you're the smart ones in our generation? You faithless and perverse generation. He says to them something you never heard the Lord Jesus say. How long do I have to put up with this crap from you? I'm sure he looked at his father and went, what a putrefied world! Why did we let it go on so long? 
And he brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. You knew your kid was jacked up from the beginning and you did nothing because you were embarrassed, because whatever reasons you have, my father knew that my brother had this propensity. He was absolutely obsessed with starting with video games, starting with magazines, you name it. There was this obsession there. And you've got to study your children and see where their weaknesses is and not let them fall. You've got to. You have too much responsibility sitting next to you. Don't leave your children to the hands of this world. Don't leave your children to the hands of the church. Don't leave your children to anybody. Do it yourself. Be involved in their lives, and when you see something, eradicate it. I'm the only one left, guys. Three brothers, all dead. And I stand here before you, giving you parents fair warning. Fair warning. And oftentimes it hath cast him in the fire, verse 22, in the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to them that believe. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. He said, I want to believe. I want to. But look at his kid! You want reality? Look at my son! I can't make this clearer. I can't say it with more power or passion. This man was broken. His son... I cannot imagine what my father feels today. Why do you think he's not here? Because guilt kills him. It's gnawing at his heels, wanting to take him to hell. It bites him and gnaws at him daily. He's twisted. He's straightened because of the guilt he feels because he did nothing when he watched his children die one by one because his life was so important. The father of the child cried out with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw the people came running together and rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, in so much as even those that were around said, The kid's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand. Remember that word, the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why, why couldn't we do that? And he said unto them, this kind come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Please give me your attention. You want your kids to live the life? There's only one thing you have to do. Anybody? Live the life. The life of a Christian is prayer and fasting, in case you didn't know. If you've been walking with the Lord any more than three years here and you've never fasted, I pity you. You what? You've never taken a meal aside for the Lord and said, God, speak to me instead of this food? That is the life. And when your children start to go astray, but I've been in church my whole life. I don't understand. I go to church. Why is my kid? Why is your kid? You praying and you fasting? Let me tell you, this kid came around about five years ago and wanted to marry my daughter, my oldest daughter. And he was slick, man. He was a big, dopey kid. And he, was... I, and he went to church every week. And he was a nice kid. And he said, you know, I know not too many girls like me because I'm, you know, I'm fat, but, but if you let me marry your daughter, I'm, I'll love her forever. And I was impressed. All right. You know, let's see what God does. You start to pray about it, I'll start to pray about it. And we prayed and we fasted. And God started to knit their hearts together. And then one day, in a prayer and fasting time, the Lord whispered a secret into, me, into my ear about this man. And I said, whoa. 
And I didn't even know what the secret was, but there was this, what we call in Christian words, a check. It was a check, checked. I don't know. I told my daughter, I, I don't know if he's the right one now. My daughter said, you choose him. Bless her heart, you choose him. I'm not, I can't. And so what I did is, I, I am, there's another book that I, I've, I've often read called The Godfather, and there's a verse in that book. It says, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. So that's what I did. I started to draw him close to me. And then I found out some things about his life that he had not told my daughter, some addictions that he had. And I said, you got one week to tell my daughter. And he didn't. So I told her, and she went berserk on him. <laughs> she threw him out. And, and you know how? You know how I prevented my kid from being thrown in the fire and thrown in the water and twisted? By prayer and fasting, all glory to God. And now she's married to a fine pastor who loves her, who had absolutely nothing to offer her in the way of finances, in the way of looks especially, is ugly. <laughs> But he loves Jesus more than he loves her. Amen. He loves Jesus more than he loves her. And that was my qualification. I went through the list and I went, looks, eh -eh. <laughs> Money, eh -eh. I went down the list and then the final one was, does he love Jesus more than he loves her? Absolutely. He's the one. The rest will grace him on. <sighs> Listen. So how's the application now? I'm glad you asked. Turn to 42 of the same verse, the same chapter. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and he were cast into the sea. Listen to what he says here, guys. And I'm going to... And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go into hell where the fire shall never be quenched and where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt, to be lame into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not, and their fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Let me explain to you. First of all, it's, it's almost like a weird spookiness he puts there, the way he repeats that over and over. Where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched. It's like, Ugh. Lord, I didn't know you spoke like that. Well, you didn't read the Bible enough then. He says, whatever it is that is in the way, cut it off. Now, honestly... Anybody ever hear the word hyperbole? This is what our Lord is employing here, hyperbole. Of course God doesn't want you to pluck your eye out. Of course God doesn't want you to hack your hand. Can you see? That's it. It off it goes. No, of course not. He's saying, if you have a partner that is a non-believer, hack it off now. But it's going to be messy. Yes. But it's better than being dragged to hell by that foot. Do you any, anybody ever step in a big pile of mud <laughs> with sneakers, pro keds? I used to wear pro keds growing up. That was the sneakers, like the Adidas of the time or something. And you step in a big pile of mud, it's like you look at the bottom of it, and, and the pro keds on the bottom, they had all these little designs and stuff with the little crevices, and you're like, oh, nuts. But I was a kid, so I was like, oh, well. So I just keep walking everywhere I went, and as it starts to dry, it cracks and you get dirt. Every Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. My father used to go nuts. <gasps> Who's got the dirt on their feet? And like, now I'm going to go clean my shoe, because it's better to wait till I get in trouble and to clean the shoe later and lie about it than to just say, hey, it was me. <laughs> Much better. It's the way we grew up. Everywhere you go, that 
junk is going to crack. And it, man, you're leaving a mess everywhere. I know, I stepped in this. Well, get rid of it. No, it's far too easy to just walk around and let my mess go everywhere than to take my shoe off and either throw it out or clean it up. Spiritual application, anybody? Listen to me. Now, I'm not saying, please, and I, I have to use this as a disclaimer, a uh, caveat. I'm not saying if you're working for somebody who's a non-believer and you go, hey, I don't want to work for them no more because uh, they don't believe in God. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, I have lots of employees that are non-believers. And let me tell you, some of my closest friends on this earth are non-believers. Some of my closest friends on this earth, gay, lesbian, whatever the, you put your sin on, I love those people. I will share the love of Christ with them. I will pray for them. I will tell them what my sin has done in my life and how they should leave their sin. However, it doesn't stop me from liking them, enjoying their company. What he says is don't enter a contractual agreement where your life and their life are now one. Because remember, here you go, spin in circles. Can't figure out why your life's going in circles and you're a believer. Why? Because you're unequally yoked, man. That is what he's talking about here. If this word was for anybody here today, Please, I beg of you, do not be fool like I was a fool and go headlong into a business that took, to this day, I still get a tax bill and is it his bill and is it my bill and there's a corporation dissolved. But do Remember what I told you at the beginning, the first thing I said? This is my book. This is my manual. He is Emmanuel. Manual? Emmanuel. <laughs> like that. He's my Emmanuel. Ready? Breathe in. Swallow. <clears throat> Do it. It'll save you a lot of hassle, I promise. Let me pray for you all. <clears throat> Dustin, you want to come up and play a closing song? I'll do an do a, a opportunity for somebody who will get saved. Father, we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to hear your word and to obey. And, and Lord Jesus, we, we ask you, please, if there is anybody here that is in the midst of or about to engage in something that will cause his life pain, God, we thank you in advance that your word is a warning. It's a light. Your word says that by your word we are warned. God, for that person that's here that needs to say no to that business venture, that needs to say no to that relationship, give them the strength to God. It's so hard. Thank you so much. Thank you. God. Hey, before I say amen, if there is one person here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior or wants to rededicate their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, what I'm going to do is give you the gospel. Dustin's going to play a song, and then you will make a decision. And what you do is you just stand up and just say, I'm ready. I'll tell you when. Here's the gospel. You, know, you guys know what the word gospel means? It means the good news the good news. And here's the good news. Christ came to save sinners of whom I'm chief. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can't go to heaven. It's that simple. You come to my house and you knock on my door. You cannot get in there unless you know me. My wife will not let you in. She will shoot you, I promise she has guns. She knows how to use them. The Lord Jesus says, it's not narrow-minded. Anybody, whoever, all you have to do is use my name, and the Father will let you in. Now, some of you might say here, and if you're from this argumentative, well, that's a little narrow-minded. What about the Buddhists? What about the monks? Listen, listen to me. Don't worry about them for now. For right now, worry about you. Because maybe God wants to save you and send you to the Buddhists. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe that's it. Great. You'll be a missionary. We'll send you out. Right now, worry about your salvation, your eternal resting place. Do you want to be in heaven? And I'm talking about the heaven that this book says, where the lion shall lay down with the lamb, where God shall wipe every tear away. This is my book, man. I believe it. I believe what this book says. Now, if you want to go to Utopia, Nirvana, or someplace else, I can't tell you how to get there. I can't. I don't know. I know this way. The Lord Jesus said in, in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. If you want that place, 
if you want the peace on earth, if you want the wisdom when you receive this word, today is your day. Dustin, will you please pray a song? Play a song, and, and Becca, play a song, and then I'm going to come back, and if you want, that's your time, you can just stand up and say, whether you're rededicating or receiving for the first time the Lord Jesus, Christians, if you're here, please be praying because the people that you don't know, the people who you would never expect to need the Lord, they need the Lord.
beckons. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And although what we do here is very much a physical picture, there is a spiritual exchange that will happen. And he will take your sin from you and he will wash you spiritually clean and you will be not only prepared for life on earth, but ready for eternity in heaven. If you need to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, stand, just stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you guys. God bless you all. If you want to just rededicate your life and say, hey, I just need a refresher. I just I need, I need a, a re-spiritual cleansing, a, a bath in the water of living water. Bless you, sister. God bless you. Congratulations. Good job. There is no shame in standing before your brothers and sisters. When you come here, you're amongst family, and there is no shame. You who want to dedicate your lives to the Lord, whether it's a rededication or a salvation, I'm going to give you words. I'm going to pray and ask you to pray with me. You who pray with me, more than just speaking, parroting words to me, please mean them from your spirit. Say it out loud, please. Dear God, I open my heart and I let you inside. Be my God. Be my Savior. Be my friend. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. For I have decided this day to follow you, Jesus. This day, forever, I'm yours. And this time, I mean it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Now, before you all go, we're going to have elders and deacons and, and wives up here. If you receive Christ as your Savior or rededicate and you just want somebody to talk to a little bit about it, that's what we're doing here. If you look at the end of the picture, if you look 20 years down the road and you say, well, I read the Bible, I fast, I pray, I'm in church. Listen, do not be frustrated by the process. I know you're looking at a mountain in front of you, but the Bible says, if you believe, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the